On the 11th of November, 1647, Charles, King of England, escapes from parliamentary custody at Hampton Court and flees to the Isle of Wight. He believes that Colonel Robert Hammond, the governor of the island, will be sympathetic to his cause. He is mistaken. Hammond places him under house arrest at Carisbrook Castle. He will remain here for over a year. As Christmas approaches, Parliament passes ordinances against the recognition of religious festivals. And in Canterbury, the mayor is forcing tradesmen to open for business as usual on Christmas Day. Riots have broken out in the city, and the ringleaders have been arrested and imprisoned in Leeds Castle pending trial. A mere three months later, a resurgent royalist army seizes Berwick and Carlisle in the north, and the parliamentary army, the new model army, is drawn to battle at St Fagans in South Wales. In 1648, rebellion against Parliament breaks out in Kent, and a royalist army of 8,000 men is mustered on Pennenden Heath, the high ground north of Maidstone. It is commanded by George Goring, Earl of Norwich. General Thomas Fairfax, Commander-in-Chief of the New Model Army, now moves from London to engage this royalist army and put down the rebellion. Fairfax knows of the rebel deployments, and so elects not to approach Maidstone from the north or west, but to circle to the south. He crosses the River Medway at East Farley late in the afternoon of the 1st of June 1648, brushing aside a small royalist picket. On hearing news of this, the Earl of Norwich sends Colonel William Brockman with another 800 men to reinforce Maidstone, bringing the town garrison up to around 4,000 men. Fairfax intends to storm Maidstone on the morrow, but the leading elements of his force become involved in heavy skirmishing with Brockman's troops, and he is drawn to battle. Street fight ensues. 
news, with the parliamentarians fighting their way in heavy rain down Tovel Lane and Stone Street, across the River Len and up Gabriel's Hill, forcing back royalist pipeline, while musketeers fire on them from the houses on either side. Braving point-blank fire from the guns at the top of Gabriel's Hill, the new model army storms the cannon and pushes the rebels back along Weep Street and into St Faith's churchyard. Following the Royalist surrender just after midnight, the rebel prisoners are held in All Saints Church, adjacent to the Archbishop's Palace. Later in the day, General Fairfax will release 1,300 of these brave men while some of their commanding officers are sent to captivity at Leeds Castle. Presbyterian members of Parliament have engaged in treaty negotiations with the King in what will become known as the Treaty of Newport. They hope that this treaty will secure a settlement with the monarch and a lasting peace. However, Oliver Cromwell and Henry Ireton are determined on bringing Charles I to trial on a charge of treason. They now remove Charles from the relative comfort of his rooms at Carisbrook and take him across the Solent to Hurst Castle, a grim fortress protecting the approaches to Southampton and Portsmouth. Here he will find little comfort. On December the 6th, the new model army moves against the Presbyterian moderates in Parliament, in what will become known as Pride's Purge. All those members in support of the Treaty of Newport are expelled, leaving a house entirely composed of the army and its supporters, in effect a military coup. This rump parliament will assume for itself full legislative powers and move rapidly to bring the king to trial. Charles is now removed from Hurst Castle and taken to Windsor on what will be a six-day journey. Travelling via Winchester, Alton and Farnham, where he will meet his nemesis, Colonel Harrison. Harrison will sit as a commissioner at the forthcoming trial and will be one of the 59 men to sign the King's death warrant. The last stage of this journey will take them to Windsor, where riots break out in the town. Charles will spend his last Christmas here, in the familiar setting of this great royal residence, before he is taken to London. The trial opens on January the 20th, 1649, in Westminster Hall. Charles refuses to acknowledge the legality of such a court and will enter no plea. Now, I would know by what authority. I mean lawful. There are many unlawful authorities in the world, thieves and robbers by the highways. But I would know by what authority I was brought from thence and carried from place to place, and I know not what. And when I know what lawful authority, I shall answer. Remember, I am your king, your lawful king, 
and what sins you bring upon your heads and the judgment of God upon this land, think well upon it. I say, think well upon it. Before you go further from one sin to a greater, Therefore let me know by what lawful authority I am seated here, and I shall not be unwilling to answer. In the meantime, I shall not betray my trust. I have a trust committed to me by God, by old and lawful descent. I will not betray it to answer to a new unlawful authority. Therefore resolve me that, and you shall hear more of me. Ten days later, Charles I is brought to the Banqueting House in Whitehall, a splendid neoclassical structure built for his father James I by Inigo Jones. Charles himself had commissioned the great ceiling mural dedicated to his father and painted by Peter Paul Rubens. It portrays the very essence of the divine right of kings. A wooden scaffold has been erected at the front of the building. Charles, King of England, is to be executed here. In the cold January air, Charles utters his final words. I go from a corruptible to an incorruptible crown, where no disturbance can be, no disturbance in the world. The Second Civil War will rage on for another two years, finally ending in the Royalist defeat at the Battle of Worcester. Nine years have passed. Charles II is restored to the throne of England. Colonel Harrison is hanged drawn and quartered for his part in the regicide. His execution is witnessed by Samuel Pepys, who will later write, He was looking as cheerful as any man could in that condition. Oliver Cromwell's body will be exhumed and decapitated, along with that of his son-in-law, Henry Ireton, and their severed, rotting heads displayed at Tyburn. However, General Thomas Fairfax once commander of the mighty New Model Army, will spend the last 11 years of his life in comfortable retirement in Yorkshire. <laughs>